All right, why don't we just uh, pray and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you for a new day in our lives. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together like this and spend time in your word, learning, studying, and seeking you, and encouraging each other, and um, stretching ourselves in you. Father, we just pray for the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, even here today, that the Spirit of Truth will write your truth, O oh God, in our hearts and our minds. That the Spirit of Truth will enlighten our hearts, our minds, open the eyes of our understanding, open our ears to hear, hear and our hearts to understand. Speak truth to us and strengthen us today. Uh, deal with things that need to be dealt with in our lives, bringing about change, bringing about growth, bringing about increase in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, yeah, in this course, we are talking about our identity in Christ, who we are in Christ, right? And uh, discovering. We are in this journey of discovering our spiritual identity. And we have to live out of that identity, live out of who we are in Christ. That's our goal. And uh, we have progressed till um, section three. Uh, we are uh, the lesson number 20. We'll start from here, from lesson number 25. We stopped somewhere there. Uh, we will start from lesson number 25 in section three. But before we start, I want to ask if you memorize scripture. Right? One very important thing that we want to learn to do, uh, and not just now, for the rest of your life, is you have to memorize scripture. Right? Even now, after you know so many years, I still uh, try to keep learning some new scriptures. Pastor, we can't hear you, Pastor. We can't hear you, Pastor. All right, you can't hear me. Um, I can see here the audio is. Hello, check. Yeah, it seems it's fine here. Other students, can you hear me? Yeah, it's clear, Pastor. I think uh, she has to check her network. Okay. Um, from our side, it looks fine. Maybe, uh, Huja, if maybe if you need to increase volume on your side, you can. I can see that. Um, because everything else seems fine here. All right. Is it okay now, Huja, on your side? It's not okay. Um, so. Do you want to, what you can do is disconnect, just log up, try logging in again, and uh, maybe that'll help reset your settings. Um, you can try that. Uh, make sure you're not, um, your volume is on, full on your side, and um, make sure that because everything else just seems right from here. Okay. All right. So one of the things that I want all, all of us to do is to constantly keep memorizing scripture. All right. So you never stop. You keep learning, putting the scriptures in your heart and in your mind. All right. All right. So uh, we, we gave us six scriptures to memorize. First one was what? Second Corinthians 5, 17. Who can say that? Please go ahead. Sit down, sit down and say. Use the mic if you want, also that the people online can hear you. Yeah. Second Corinthians 5:17. Who is in the Jesus Christ? He's a, a new creation. All the all things 
old things has passed away and all the things has become new all things have become new very good yeah, give them a good hand clap <laughs> all right okay ephesians 4 what else next verse you didn't write it down i give you five or six scriptures right what's the next one sorry okay second corinthians 5 and verse 20 okay that comes in the next section who knows second corinthians 5 21 go ahead Vinay. Yeah, can you pass the mic? He was uh, made sin who knew no sin, uh, so that we become the righteousness of God. And we should become the, the righteousness, righteousness of God. Of he, God. Him who knew no sin became sin for us, so that we should become the righteousness of God in Him. Right? Good. Good clap. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4. Who memorized that? Who knows that? Okay, I want all of you to be putting up your hands. Like, no, Pastor, no, we can't hear you, Pastor. Um, Pooja, everybody else can hear me. Um, okay, so uh, can somebody... Uh, All right, uh, everyone else. So uh, maybe uh, Avinas, maybe you can um, speak to her directly and call her and call her on the phone and just just help her out. Yes. Um, yeah. So I want all of you to be putting up your hands. Okay, not just one or two. Uh, you can call her on the phone. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, yeah, you take care of it. You don't have to tell me, please. Um, Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. Yeah. Okay, let somebody else do it. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. The back over there. Please. Blessed be the Lord God in Jesus Christ. Uh, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In Christ, in Christ, just as He chose us before the foundation of the world, that just we, as He chose us in Him, in Him, uh, before the foundation of the world, that we must be holy without blame before Him in love. Very good, very good. Nice, nice. All right. So, what else did we memorize? Um, Ephesians four twenty three twenty four. Did I give you that? No. All right. What else? Romans, oh, 3.22, yes, Romans 3.22, go ahead. There is no difference, yes, very good, nice. Okay, what else? First Corinthians 1.30, yes. Uh, in Jesus, uh, we but, are in Jesus Christ. But of Him you are in uh, Christ. But of Him you are in Christ, and uh, God, who of God, who became wisdom for from God, and in Him we receive uh, uh, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. And redemption. redemption. Oh, slight improvement. <laughs> okay, but it's good. All right. All right. First Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Did I tell you that? Okay. I think that's our last one. First Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Online students, uh, if you want, you can just uh, type it out or try to memorize them. Okay. I can't ask you, but please. All right. First Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Um, no, verse 9. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Uh, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor uh, adulterers nor uh, homosexuals, nor sodomites, uh, verse 10, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor dunk drunkards, nor uh, revealers, nor exhorters will uh, inherit the kingdom of God, verse 11, and uh, such. such were some of you, uh, but you were sanctified, but you, you were washed, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Very good. <laughs> nice. Good job, good job, good job. 
All right, so um, all of these passages, all right? I want all of you to know these scriptures, right? And uh, last and last not Sunday, last week we talked about the the benefit of knowing these scriptures, having them in your heart. I need to have God's word in your heart, right? Uh, it's going to help us, strengthen us. It's a weapon against the enemy, right? So you need to have God's word in your heart, right? Okay, uh, let's get started. Let's go to uh, lesson number 25. I'm going to share this, uh, share my screen as well. And we will continue from where we stopped last week. And uh, we'll give you some more scriptures to keep mem memorizing. Okay? And uh, let's go forward. All right. So in this section, we've been talking about our standing before God. Right? As a new creation, as a person who is in Christ, you must understand your spiritual standing, your spiritual standing, how God sees you, how the spiritual realm sees you. Right? You need to understand that. And we need to live out of that, live out of our spiritual standing before God and, of course, before um, the powers of darkness as well. So let's go to lesson 25. We'll just quickly review this, and we will take it forward. Um, lesson 25, page 36, page 37, Romans 3.22, which is one of the scriptures we memorized. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. So God's righteousness has been given to you. And it is upon you. So think about that. Whose righteousness? God's. God's own righteousness. It's like, to our mind, if you really sit and think about it, it's, it's unimaginable. Yeah? That God would take His righteousness and give it to you and me. So it's like, wow. Almost, it's too much <laughs> that God would take. He is so holy, so perfect. I mean, there's, there's no imperfection in God. That's his righteousness. And he has taken that, and the Bible says it's to all and on all who believe. It's given to you, it's on you. Because you believe in Jesus. There is no difference. Like God never is not partial. Oh, I'll give it to him. I won't give it to him. I'll give it to him. No, no. There's no difference. All to everyone. Everyone who believes has been given the righteousness of God and has been made the righteousness of God. Right? So you need to accept that. We just have to accept it. Right? We didn't do anything to earn this. We cannot. God is so perfect. God is so holy. God is so pure. There's no way we can earn this. Nothing we can do. All we have to do, he says, is through faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. Through faith in Jesus. That's it. And now God's righteousness on you. It's a gift. The Bible says it's the gift of righteousness. Now what a gift. It's a gift. Gift of righteousness. So... But we have to accept it. We have to embrace it. We have to start living by it. So whenever we will talk about the application, like whenever you go to pray, you start from that place. I am the righteousness of God. Because that is what gives us the, the right or the freedom to come into his presence. Right? Otherwise, we are not qualified. We, we are not fit. On our own, we're not fit to come into his presence. But because he has given you his righteousness, you can come from, you can come into his presence. So you start from there. God has given me his righteousness. That is why I can come freely to pray, to worship. Right? So this is a very, very powerful truth. Right? And uh, we spent some time on that. Let's go to lesson number 26. 
we have been justified and made righteous through faith. Now, the word justified and made righteous is actually synonymous. It means the same thing, just two different words. Justified means you've been made just as if you never sinned. Justified. Made righteous means the same thing. If you are just as if you never sinned, you're righteous. Right? So it means the same thing, just different words. But it is through faith, through faith. That's the only thing God is saying you must have in order to receive this gift. It is through faith, not of works. It's not by, now of course, we do righteousness because we have become righteous. Right? So obviously we do what is right. We live in holiness and all of that. We do it. But remember, it's God who has made us righteous first. He made us righteous. Through faith. Right? So you see there, Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. I'm on page 38. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith. So that means it's already done. Having been, already done. Having been justified by faith. It's already finished for us. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have been justified by faith and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So when we are justified by faith, what do we have now? We have peace with God. Peace with God means we are at friends with God. Right? God is not angry with us. God is not upset with us. We have peace with God. If two people are at friends with each other, they're fine, free. You know, they can. So you have peace with God because you've been justified. So in our minds, many times the devil puts thoughts. God is angry. God is not happy with you. No. You can't pray. You can't worship. God is, today, God is going to punish you. Fire and brimstone will fall on you today. <laughs> no. The Bible says we have been justified by faith and we have peace with God. With our Lord, through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. We are friends with God. We put it another way. We are friends with God. We are, have a good relationship with God. Right? Uh, the, there's another word, technical word, is atonement. Atonement means to make peace between people. So Jesus is our atonement. He's the one who's made peace between us and God. So through Jesus, we have peace with God. We are in good terms with God. French, friendship with God. Right? And verse 2. Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. That means we are standing in a place of grace. So two things we are seeing here. Because we've been made righteous through faith. Two things. One, we have peace with God. Two, we are in a place of grace. That means... God, you are in a place where God is going to pour His grace on you, not His judgment on you. And some people, oh, God is going to judge you. God is going to punish you. No. You're not in a place of punishment. You're in a place of grace. We are standing in this place of grace. So if the, de if the thought comes, devil puts a thought, today God is going to punish you. No. Bible says, I am standing in a place of grace. Because it says, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. I am standing in a place of grace before God. Right? And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So we can be full of joy. We have peace with God. We are in a place of grace. 
and we are full of joy because we are going to experience the glory, the goodness of God. So what has receiving the gift of righteousness done for us? It has put us in, the, in this place of peace with God. It has put us in this place where there is grace. We are standing in a place of grace. And therefore, we can be full of joy. We can be full of joy. Rejoice. With the expectation of the glory of God. So what are you expecting? The punishment of God? No. What are you expecting? God is upset with you, so today He's going to spoil your day? No. Your expectation is the glory of God. Are you understand? Yes or no? Right? So that is what has happened for us. Because we have been made the righteousness of God through faith. That's it. That's all you had. Just faith in God. Look at what Paul said in some other places. In Philippians 3, 8 and 9. Bottom of page 38. Philippians 3, 8 and 9. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Underline, in him. He's talking about life in Christ. Be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. So what Paul is saying. See, Paul is he's mentioning his, his upbringing. He was a Jew, Hebrew. He, was, uh, he studied the law and he followed the law very strictly. Lived a very righteous life. But still he is saying, I am not depending on my own. Righteousness through the law. I'm not depending on that. I am depending on the righteousness which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that is from God. That's what I'm depending on. So I'm not depending on my own righteousness. Although he was, you know, you can imagine he, he was, must have been a very, you know, strict person. You know, a, a Pharisee. So very disciplined, very strict, living according to the law. All of that. But he still says, I'm not depending on the righteousness which is through the law. I'm depending on the righteousness which is from God through faith. That's what I'm depending on. So, this is something we must learn to do. Uh, many times, we tend to base our righteousness on what we have done or not done. But don't do that. Just like Paul. So I'm not depending, verse 9, not having my own righteousness which is based on the law. I'm not depending on that. I'm not depending on the righteousness on, you know, works, things I have done. On No. What am I depending on? I'm depending on the righteousness which is through faith in Jesus. The righteousness from God. So, when we go to pray, when we worship and everything we do in spiritual realm depend on the righteousness that is from God through faith. Depend on that. Even though you may have made a, lived a good and righteous life, of course, that is good. We are supposed to do that. Yes, you have been walking righteous, wonderful, but you still are not depending on that because that will still fall short of God's standard of righteousness. Our righteousness will never match up to God's standard, no matter how good we are. Right? So we are not depending on our own righteousness through the law, through the works, but we are always depending on the righteousness which, is, which God has given through faith. That's what we are depending. So in our minds, when you're going to pray, worship, God, I'm coming to you. Not because today I've been a very good person. No. I'm coming to you because you gave me your righteousness. Amen? That's what Paul is saying. And that's how we should. Right? 
Any questions? Okay. Let's go to next lesson number 27. Justified and righteous freely by His grace. From our side, all God says is, I want you to have faith, believe in Jesus. And then from His side, He gives righteousness freely by grace. Not, by, not because we deserved it. Remember, this is a grace, a gift of grace. Freely by grace, He has given this to us. Right? Romans 3.24, being justified freely by His grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So in Christ Jesus. We have been justified freely by His grace. Underline that. Freely by His grace. Freely by His grace. We have been justified freely by His grace. This is a free gift of God. Again. In Titus chapter 3, verses 4 to 7. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Look at verse 7. That having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Notice verse 7. We have been justified by His grace. And by His grace, He has given this as a gift to us. So it's not something we have earned. And we must understand lesson number 28. It is because of the blood of Jesus. That means... Jesus paid the price for this. Right? God is giving it to us freely. Because Jesus paid the price. So although we are saying it's free, it's free because somebody paid the price. Jesus paid the price. That's why God can give us righteousness. He can give, us, give it to us freely. By grace. Romans 3, 24 and 25. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So through the redemption, because of the redemption, the redeeming work of Christ. Because of that, we are justified freely. And verse 25. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith. To demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. That word propitiation, you can put a line there, put a note there. It means mercy seat. Mercy seat. Whom God set forth as a mercy seat. By his blood. Now, what is the mercy seat? In the Old Testament, when God told Moses to build a tabernacle where the people would come to worship, so there was the tabernacle at three sections there, there was the outer court, uh, there was the inner court, and then there was the most holy place. The most holy place only the high priest could go. And he would go only once a year. And in the most holy place, there was the Ark of the Covenant, which was a box which, um, uh, which had the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. So the Ark of the Covenant. On top of that box, the Ark of the Covenant, was the mercy seat. It's almost like, imagine, it's almost like a little throne seat. And it represented the place where two things will happen. One, the high priest would sprinkle the blood. So once a year, he would make 
it was on the day of atonement in Hebrew it was Yom Kippur so on the day of atonement he will take the blood of the sacrificial animal he'll go all the way inside and he will sprinkle the blood on the mercy seats on the mercy seat and because of that the sins of the nation all the whole nation will be forgiven God is okay now it was only that mercy seat was pointing to the real mercy seat that is Jesus Christ that is in Christ God would forgive all our sins so that's why he's saying whom God set as a mercy seat right verse 25 that mercy seat was a type it was just a resemblance it was pointing to Jesus who's the real mercy seat in Christ the blood he shed his own blood and God was forgiving the sins of the people the other thing that happened on the mercy seat was God said that is where his glory will come and he will meet with his people Mercy seat. So mercy seat stood for two things: the place where forgiveness would happen, and the place where people will meet face to face with God through the high priest. Now, at that time, those days, only the high priest was allowed there. But he said, "That's where my presence will come. I will speak to you. I will meet with you on the mercy seat." It's like a symbol, a symbol of God's presence. But in the New Testament, Romans three twenty-five, Bible is saying. God set Jesus as our mercy seat. Whom God set forth as a propitiation. Greek means mercy seat. So that's the place where our sins are forgiven. So the English translators put the English word propitiation means the place where our sins are forgiven. Right? So they put the meaning of it. But the actual Greek simply says mercy seat. God has said Jesus to be our mercy seat, the place where our sins are forgiven and the place where God meets with us, right? By his blood, in the Old Testament, it was the blood of bulls and goats. Eh? In the New Testament, it is the blood of Jesus Christ because of his own blood. So I'm forgiving your sins. Right? So, why do we have the righteousness of God? It is because Jesus shed his own blood. We have been justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus. And he has become our mercy seat with his own blood, with his own blood. So that is why we are righteous because of the blood of Jesus. So we should say that, you know, my sins are forgiven. I have been made righteous by the blood of Jesus, freely by his grace, through faith in Christ. That's all. Through faith in Christ, I have been made righteous. Let's look at a few more scriptures on this. Romans 5 verse 9. In that same chapter, Romans 5, Paul makes this statement, much more than having now been justified by his blood. So clear, straight away. We have been justified by his blood. It's the blood of Jesus that has justified us, made us righteous, holy, clean. We shall be saved from wrath through him. So, our confidence is in the blood. We have been justified through the blood. So why can you say, I am the righteousness of God? Why, how can you say you are righteous in God's eyes? Because it is through His blood. Because of His blood that we've been justified. Same thing, Colossians 1, 20 and 21. And by Him, to reconcile all things to himself. So again, you underline those time, the words he says, you know, by him, by him, by him. That means it's all talking about what is ours in Christ. In him, through him, by him. 
right? It's all talking about uh, that Romans 5.9, it says through him, uh, other places in him. Now in Colossians 1.20, it says by him, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So we have peace, atonement, we have peace through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. So we have peace through the blood of Jesus. So, what are some practical implications? So in bottom of page 40, practical implications of being justified and made righteous. What, what does it mean? There is no condemnation against us. So we live free from any sense of guilt, shame, accusation, or condemnation. There is no condemnation against us. Secondly, we have boldness to enter into God's presence and uh, we can walk in closeness with God and fellowship with God. We're going to look at these scriptures. We reign in life. That means we exert dominion over life situations uh, that have been caused by sin, sickness, and Satan. We confront Satan as king and master over him and his demons, right? So all of these things, uh, uh, and we, we must be careful to maintain continual fellowship with the Lord. So we're going to look at uh, each of these. So lesson number 29. Because you've been made righteous, how do you apply this? How do you lift this up? Number one, first one, there is no condemnation. No condemnation. That there is, you, you and I don't have to live with a sense of guilt, shame, condemnation. Don't have to live under that. Romans 8 verse 1. So we are all going to memorize Romans 8 1. Right? Please memorize Romans 8 and verse 1. Okay? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Romans 8.1, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So God is not condemning you. So you don't have to be under guilt, shame, and condemnation. Don't have to live, live under that. So many people, and this is a big problem for many people, right? That, yeah, we've all done, we all made mistakes in the past. We've all done bad things. I'm not saying we should not repent. We should repent, confess, forsake sin. But we don't need to live under guilt, shame, and condemnation. That is not what God wants for us. Why? Because there is no condemnation. But the devil, he is the accuser of the brethren. He is the accuser. Of, that means he accuses us always. Oh, you're, you're you know, telling us how bad you are. That's his strategy. He's the accuser. The Holy Spirit doesn't accuse us. The Holy Spirit convicts us. Convicts us means he tells us, you've done something wrong, you need to repent. You, you need to get back in right relationship with God. Accusation says, you've done something wrong, God doesn't love you, and you can never be in right relationship with God. So the accusation moves us away from God, conviction draws us to God. You understand the difference? Right? So there is no condemnation. To those who are in Christ, Jesus. Romans 8, 33 and 34. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It means who can accuse us? 
It is God who justifies. God himself has justified us. God himself has declared us free from guilt and shame. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So Paul is asking the question, who can accuse us? Who can condemn us? Who can bring a charge against us? God himself has justified us. The, the highest judge, could say Supreme Court, has said you are free from guilt. Supreme Court has said, the highest judge has said free. The chief justice has said you are not guilty. Who can accuse you? And the very one who paid for our sins, it says, who can condemn us? Jesus, he's at the right hand of God. He's alive and he's at the right hand of God. He's standing there to intercede. He's saying, hey, I paid for them. I paid for their sin. My blood has cleansed them. So who can accuse you? Who can condemn you? You understand? So this is the truth we must know. If we don't know this truth, the devil will use condemnation against us. Make us feel guilty, make us feel worthless, and we won't do anything. But when we know what God has done for us, we know that there is no condemnation. We can hold our head up high. Say, God, thank you. And we can walk freely. In his presence. Romans 3.26. Paul says to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness. That he might be just. And the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. Very interesting truth here. He's saying God is the judge. And as judge. He's a just judge. So he's not just going to overlook sin. And yet, being the judge and being a just judge, he's also able to declare us, to justify us. How? Because on one side, the punishment was put on Jesus. So God is just, meaning sin is being punished, or sin has been punished. The price has been paid. So he is just. And the same God is the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The same God is saying, okay, I'm declaring you free. The God who said, sin must be punished. And the punishment for sin is death. He's just. But the same God is the justifier of those who believe in Jesus. So in this verse he's saying, you know, God himself is being righteous. He's being righteous. He's, being, he's doing the right thing. He is just and the justifier of those who believe in Jesus. So the one who has faith in Jesus. So even God is not going against himself. He's forgiving us. Right? So Romans 8.1 uh, from the Passion Translation. Let's read it out together. So now the case is closed. Your case is? So if the devil comes, you say, devil, too late. Case is? It was closed 2,000 years ago. Case is closed. What you're bringing, what you're causing problems? Case is closed. The case is closed. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the anointed one. Case is closed. So we are not arguing, are you righteous or not? We are not trying to defend ourselves. We don't have to stand in the court and say, hello, judge, I've come today. Case is closed, finished. 2,000 years ago, your case was finished. 
dismissed. And the verdict was, you are righteous, devil is condemned, finished, matter is over. So don't open your case again. Don't start here. Why? There's no needs. Just accept. Lord, thank you. There is no condemnation against me because I am in Jesus Christ. Amen? Let me pause here. Uh, any questions? All right, let me see. Online. All right. Online, some questions. If anyone is in Christ, okay. Which I hope you you can hear now. Our righteousness is justification by faith in the grace. Mm. All right. So there's a question. Um, what do we say of Old Testament people like Job and Noah, who are found to be righteous? So a couple of things that we can say about the Old Testament. Uh, of course, they were righteous people, meaning they lived holy lives, but they were also sinners. That means they were not perfect. But even people under the Old Testament, two things. First, God accounted righteousness to them because of faith. So example, Genesis 15, I think it's verse 3. And it's repeated again in Romans, the fourth chapter. It says about Abraham, God accounted or gave him a credit okay, of righteousness by faith. Romans, it's Genesis 15. Let me tell you, it's just, I'm having a doubt. Was it 3 or 6? Genesis 15. Yeah, Genesis 15 and verse 6, correct, sorry, that's right, Genesis 15, 6, it says, he accounted to him for righteousness, Abraham believed, so even in the Old Testament, it was the same thing, they also had faith, and when they had faith, God accounted, Genesis 15, 6, he, it's like he gave them a credit, on what basis? On the basis that the price was going to be paid in Jesus Christ. Same thing, right? So it, it was based on faith and it was based on what Christ was going to do on the cross. It was like an advance. It was a credit. So that's how Old Testament people received righteousness. Same way as we it was through faith. They believed. But it was an advance on the basis that Christ was going to pay for their sin. For us, it's back. The price has been paid, so now we get the benefit. Right? But it's all based on the cross of Jesus. Okay. So that's the answer to your question. All right. Another one. Uh, uh, John says, in scripture, we are justified, in the script, as it is mentioned, scripture, we are justified righteous by grace and no condemnation. What about the generational curses due to disobedience of law as per Deuteronomy? Okay, so that's a good question. So John's question is, so we know that we have been made righteous, uh, we are in grace, no condemnation, all that. But what about this generational curse thing? You know, what about that? So one is, we know that it's a real thing. So we're not denying it's not there. What, 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 what actually happens? See, sin always opens the door to the devil. Okay? So somebody sins. What are we doing? We are giving the devil an opportunity to come and do pro cause problems in our lives. Sin opens the door. Uh, a, a, a verse of scripture is in Genesis chapter 4, and I think it's verse 6, where God is telling um, Cain, um, Genesis 4, 6, the second half of it, if you do well, if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, 
and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Genesis 4. So God is telling Cain, sin is waiting at the door. If you don't do well, I mean, if you do the wrong, then sin is waiting to come and control you. But God is telling Cain, but you must rule over it. That means keep the door closed. Right? So that's a nice picture there. Genesis 4, 6 about what we are saying. That means if we sin, we continue in sin, we actually open the door and sin will dominate us and work in our lives. And then what happens? This gets passed on to generation, generation. Okay, let me let me pause here. Let me, let's just go for the break because I, the bell rang. We'll go for the break and we'll come back in 10 minutes and I'll answer this, continue this, okay? All right? So let's come back in 10 minutes and we'll continue this. Thank you.